Good. So um, welcome to today's online uh, class. And um, it is on um, reversible mm -hmm. reactions. And um, uh, basically, today we are going to look at reversible reactions. And we start by defining reversible reactions. We say these are reactions where, which can be able to proceed both in the forward direction and in the reverse direction. Um, so in many reactions, the product usually interact and they revert back into the reactants. For example, you can be able to see the equation on the screen. You have um, a SO2, that is sulfur 4 oxide, combining with oxygen to form SO3, sulfur 6 oxide. So here, the reactants, which is SO2 and oxygen, can be able to interact to give you the product. At the same time, the product can revert back to give you the reactant. So in such a reaction usually takes place in an enclosed environment, in such a way that the products are not allowed to escape. So when that happens, then a reversible reaction is able to take place. Some more examples of re reversible reactions. We have um, cobalt-2, COCl2. It can be able to give you uh, carbon-2 oxide plus chlorine. At the same time, these uh, products can be able to revert back and give you COCl2. Uh, you can be able to see a double-edged arrow. The upper one represents what you call the forward reaction. The lower one represents what you call the reverse reaction. Now, when this reaction progresses like that, it can be able to proceed to what you call a chemical equilibrium. What is a chemical equilibrium? A chemical equilibrium is where the rate of the forward reaction becomes equal to the rate of backward reaction. When that happens, then we talk about a chemical equilibrium. A chemical equilibrium, both the forward and the reverse reactions, as you have said, they continue. But because their rates are equal, there is no net change in the concentrations of the reaction components. So uh, when equilibrium is reached, the reaction is going on, but the rate of the forward reaction is equal to the rate of the reverse reaction. Now, there's a diagram here which tries to show the relationship between the forward reaction and the reverse reaction. The forward reaction is represented by A, the reverse reaction is represented by B. So in the forward, at the beginning uh, of the reaction, when time is equal to zero, you can see that B, which represents the re reverse reaction, the concentration of the, of the product is very low, but the concentration of the reactants is very high. As time progresses, the, the, the reactants the concentration begins to decrease. At the same time, the concentration of the products begins to increase until a time is reached when an equilibrium state is attained, whereby the rate of the forward reaction and the rate of the reverse reaction are equal. So at such a state, then we talk about equilibrium. So these are very important points as far as reversible reactions are concerned. Because at equilibrium, that is now where the rate of the forward reaction is equal to the rate of the reverse reaction. Now, uh, having understood now this graph here or this diagram, then we can be able to look at what you call the Lejeune's principle. So, um, Lejeune's principle is a principle which tries to analyze the factors which affect the equilibrium. I've shown what we mean by the equilibrium. So. This scientist by the name of Lee Jatel was able to come up with a principle which governs reversible reactions. And it states, as shown on the screen, it says that if a stress stroke change is applied to a system in a dynamic equilibrium, the system changes in a way that reduces the stress. 
I repeat again, if a stress or a change is applied to a system in, in a dynamic equilibrium, the system changes in a way that relieves the stress. So if I just uh, revert back to this diagram, once the equilibrium has been attained, as shown here, then the equilibrium can be able to keep on shifting. But it will be able to shift. That is why we are calling it dynamic equilibrium state. That means the rate of the forward reaction and the rate of the reverse reaction, they are equal. So if a change or what you are calling a stress is introduced at this point, then the equilibrium can be able to shift either towards the right or towards the left in such a way that it can be able to remove that change which has been introduced. So that statement is what we call Lee Jatel's principle. What are these types of stresses which can be able to come into, which can be able to affect the equilibrium position? There are three of them. The first one is called change in the um, concentration. The second one is called change in temperature. And the third one is called change in pressure. So we want to look at these three stresses, all these three changes, which can affect the position of the equilibrium. Number one, change in concentration. Number two, change in temperature. Number three, change in pressure. And the factors can be seen in this slide here. So you can see there is change in concentration. We have changes in temperature. And the number three, we have changes in pressure. Good. Now we look at each one of them one by one. And one of them, it is the change in concentration. We want to understand how a change in concentration can bring about a shift in the position of the equilibrium. Now, if you look at this equation here, it cannot be very clear, but on the left-hand side, we have bromine, which is yellow, orange, plus water. Those are the reactants. And then um, in here, we have our double arrow. So on the right-hand side, we have the product. The products, one, we have the hypobromite ions. Number two, we have bromine. These are the bromide ions, and we have the hydrogen ions. So I am going to request you to write this equation because we shall be referring to it even in the next slide. So on the left-hand side, we have bromine, and the color is yellow, orange. Then on the right-hand side, we have hypobromite OBR minus BR minus and 2H positive. They are colorless and they are in equilibrium position. Now, we want to look at two scenarios. Number one, when we add sodium hydroxide to the equilibrium. As you know, sodium hydroxide is a base and therefore, when you add a base to this equilibrium position, it will react automatically with an acid. Now, on the right-hand side here, you can be able to see an acid represented by hydrogen ions. When we see hydrogen ions, this is 2H+. When you see hydrogen ions, they represent an acid. When a base is added to the acid, Look at this equation here. We know that neutralization takes place, whereby hydroxide plus hydrogen ions will give us water. Now, one, this is what you are calling the stress you are introducing into the equilibrium position. What have you done is to decrease the concentration, because when you react it with a base, you are decreasing the concentration of hydrogen ions. According to Lijatel's principle, this equilibrium is going to shift in such a way that it can remove that stress. So the reaction is going to proceed in a way that it's going to restore the hydrogen which has been removed. 
therefore, we say that the equilibrium is going to shift towards the right, to the side where uh, a change has been introduced, so that it can be able to produce more hydrogen ions to replace the hydrogen which has been used up. So it's a very, that point you really need to understand it very, very well. So what will be the observation which will be seen? When you add sodium hydroxide, the color will change from yellow, orange, to colorless. Why? Because more of the reactants will be reacting to form the product, which is the hydrogen ion which has been removed. Alternatively, if you add an acid, so look at this thing here. The process removes hydrogen ions from the equilibrium mixture. This shifts the equilibrium to the right, hence formation of more products. This leads to a change in color from yellow-orange to colorless. Still on the same, if you add an acid to this mixture here in equilibrium, the acid will increase the, the hydrogen ion concentration. When the hydrogen, when that one in, when the acid concentration increases, you will be, you will have introduced a stress on the right hand side. Therefore, the 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 the, the product will react to be able to go back to revert back to the bromine solution. So if you add an acid instead, the equilibrium is going to shift towards the left where the color change will be from colorless to yellow. So that is a case when you change the concentration of, the, of the, any of the solutions here. The same can apply. For example, if you add more water, if you add more water, then the equilibrium is going to shift towards the right. If you remove water, the equilibrium will shift towards the left, and so on and so forth. Now, um, I also want to discuss, let's, for example, talk about pressure. Remember, we said there are three, um, there are three factors which can cause a shift in the position of the equilibrium. The first one is change in concentration. The second one is changes in pressure. Temperature. Yes, and another one is change in temperature. Now, let's talk about pressure, then we'll, talk, we'll come to temperature. Now, if you look at this equation here, it's a common equation. It is the Haber process where ammonia is formed from hydrogen and nitrogen. Now, for that reaction to take place, pressure must be exerted. So this is the initial equilibrium where hydrogen and ammonia are, and the nitrogen are existing together with ammonia. If you increase pressure, you can be able to see here the, 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 this piston has been pressed downwards, then the equilibrium is disturbed by an increase in pressure. How will the system respond? It will, a new equilibrium is established with fewer molecules. Remember, Boyle is wrong, that uh, pressure is inversely proportional to volume. Therefore, when you increase pressure, the volume is going to decrease. Therefore, um, I don't have that equation with me here, but you remember the equation where you write nitrogen plus hydrogen giving you ammonia. If you balance that equation, you're going to get that you require one, one nitrogen combining with the three hydrogen molecules to form two ammonia molecules. So the equilibrium is going to shift to the side where there, is a, a, there are fewer molecules. And where there are fewer molecules, it is where ammonia is going to be formed. Therefore, we say when you increase the pressure, the equilibrium is going to shift to the side, to the to the side where more ammonia is going to be formed. Because when you compare the reactants and the products, ammonia has uh, fewer molecules compared to hydrogen and nitrogen. Uh, it's unfortunate that I don't have that equation with me here, but I hope if you try to write it, it will be very clear to you. Now, um, 
Let me talk about changes in temperature. Let me talk about changes in temperature. In the diagram here, you can be able to see two gases. One of them is called nitrogen dioxide. Nitrogen dioxide, we know it is a brown, red brown in color. Another gas, it's called dinitrogen tetraoxide, N2O4. That gas, it's almost colorless. Now, when you when you when you introduce when you change the temperature of an equilibrium position or of a, of a system which is in equilibrium then um when you try to write the equation unfortunately i don't have that equation with me here let me see if i have it um good um so let me just uh, exit just a moment let me get some um some some other slides here for us but let me uh, first of all explain. Uh, sorry, let me just a moment. Uh, pause. So, if you can be able to see on this slide here, we have an equation between um, NO2, sorry, this is NO2 here, and then we have N2O4. You have said NO2 is uh, uh, brown in color, N2O4, it is parallel. Now, just before we conclude this discussion, I want to bring your attention to the fact that um, we have two types of reactions as far as temperature is concerned. A reaction can either be exothermic or it can be endothermic. An exothermic reaction, usually it is represented by a negative, meaning that there is a loss of energy, heat energy. Endothermic reaction, it's a reaction where there is an increase in, uh, in energy of the system. It will be able to absorb heat energy from the surrounding, and therefore there's going to be an increase. So this table here summarizes by saying, for an exothermic reaction, when you increase the temperature, then the equilibrium is going to shift towards the left. When you decrease the temperature, the equilibrium will shift towards the right. For an endothermic process, when you increase the temperature, the reaction is going to shift towards the right. And when you decrease the temperature, the reaction will shift towards the left. So I want to illustrate this. This one comes from the fact that for an exothermic reaction, it's, an ex it's a reaction which is already producing heat. So if you increase the temperature, you'll kind of slow down that particular reaction. That is why it will increase towards the left. But for an endothermic reaction, this an endothermic, this is a reaction which will increase if you increase the temperature. So if you increase the temperature, you will favor the forward reaction, therefore it will proceed towards the right. Towards the right, it means there is going to be formation of more product. Now, let me go back to, let me, let's look at this example here, for example. You have hydrogen, if you can be able to see down here, we have hydrogen plus CO2 forming CO plus H2O. Now, Ivy, is this an endothermic or an exothermic reaction? It's an endothermic. Excellent. What that means, according to our table here, if you increase the temperature, then the reaction is going to proceed towards the right. That means more products are going to be formed. If you decrease the temperature, then the reverse reaction is going to progress. That means uh, the, the, the reactants, all the products on the left are going to be formed. Look at the second one. That means that is SO2 plus oxygen to form SO3. This reaction is um, represented by a minus here. That means it is an exothermic reaction. Now, yeah. if you increase the temperature for an exothermic reaction, this reaction will progress. That means more of SO2 and oxygen are going to be formed. But if you decrease the temperature, then more of SO3 is going to be formed. Is that okay? Yes. Thank you. 
And I, I always uh, advise my students to look at this sign, yeah, especially for changes in temperature, look at the sign. If it is positive, that means the reaction will progress towards the right. If it is negative, it's an exothermic reaction. If you increase the temperature, the reaction will progress towards the left. Now, uh, let, let's conclude on uh, this, um, this um, nitrogen four oxide here. Nitrogen four oxide and the nitrogen the oxide, they can exist in a dynamic equilibrium in a closed test tube. Nitrogen four oxide is a brown gas. The nitrogen tetraoxide is a yellow gas. Now, if you heat, if you heat and increase temperature, the mixture becomes more brown. Why is that? Is that so? If you increase the temperature, the formation, um, first of all, the formation of nitrogen 2 oxide is an exothermic reaction. Therefore, if you increase the temperature, the reaction will progress towards the left. That means you'll see more of the brown color, this one here. The formation of nitrogen 4 oxide is an endothermic process. So if you increase the temperature, you'll be able to see this reaction being formed. If you cool, that means the formation of nitro, uh, N2 or 4, the nitrogen tetraoxide, is an exothermic process. Therefore, if you increase the temperature or if you cool, then it is going to be preferred. More of the nitrogen tetraoxide is going to be formed. So um, that is it. That, that's it. You want to be able to understand that the formation of NO2 is an exothermic process. Therefore, Increasing the temperature will favor the formation of more NO2. Decreasing the temperature will favor the formation of N2 or 4. Finally, uh, we, have, we have talked about the three factors. Now, usually we talk about a catalyst. It is important to note, to note that a catalyst does not increase, uh, affect the position of the equilibrium. There are only three factors which affect the position of an equilibrium, temperature, pressure, and the concentration. So what happens to a catalyst? A catalyst, usually it speeds up the rate of the reaction. It speeds up the attainment of the equilibrium position. If you can be able to see this diagram here, if you have, if this is the, the one shown in red, it is the ordinary reaction which has not been catalyzed. But once you use a catalyst, then you can be able to see what happens here. It is going to reduce, it, it reduces, we call this one the activation energy, the energy which is required for the reaction to be able to take place. It reduces this heel. You can see the heel has been reduced from up here to down here. So a catalyst will mean that the reaction will be take place faster, and therefore the attainment of the equilibrium position will be faster. But it does not shift the equilibrium to the left or towards the right. So that statement, you can be able to see it on the screen very, very clearly. Good. Um, so let's, so that's a summary of those factors you've mentioned, temperature, concentration, pressure. Look at the effects. Increasing the temperature shifts the equilibrium in the direction that takes in heat. Concentration. Increasing concentration shifts the equilibrium in the direction that produces less of that substance. And increasing pressure shifts the equilibrium in the direction that produces less gas. So that's just a summary of what you've discussed. So we'll just repeat them until they, they sink in. If the temperature is increased, equilibrium shifts to decrease the temperature and the equilibrium, the equilibrium shifts in the endothermic direction. So uh, th those are just a summary of the things which you have discussed. And um, look at that equation. We have talked about this equation here. And we have said that the formation of nitrogen 2 oxide, it is an exothermic reaction. So when you, when you increase the temperature, Rather, the formation of the of N two O four is an exothermic reaction. So, when you increase the temperature, the equilibrium will shift towards the left. When you decrease the temperature, the equilibrium will shift towards the right. 
very good. I'm sure you can be able to see that the equilibrium will shift to decrease the temperature. That means to the left. So we are just going to go through these ones until you understand. That means more NO2 is going to be produced because this is an exothermic reaction. If temperature is decreased, more N2O4 will be produced. So we are just repeating these points until it becomes very, very clear. Now, um, le let me talk about something else here. Let me talk about something else. Um, we have talked about pressure already. And um, there's something I want to picture here. Now, I want to talk about some industrial processes and how you can be able to use the rates of reaction and the equilibrium position. One of them is the Haber process, which is the manufacture of ammonia. In the Haber process, uh, we have the following reactants, nitrogen and hydrogen, which react together. Why is it that um, companies, what problem do companies making ammonia obtain? Look at this equation here. If you look at this equation here, for us to form more ammonia, we need to do the following. Number one, we increase the temperature. Why am I saying that? Because when you look at the reactants, the reactants, these are three molecules, one molecule. We have four molecules on the left-hand side and only two molecules on the right-hand side. Therefore, if you increase the temperature, the reaction will progress to the side where there's only is formation of more ammonia. So in the industry where they are producing uh, ammonia, they require an increase in pressure. Now, look at that. Hydrogen and nitrogen combined here. Just look at that clip. Look at that clip. Stage number three is where we have the converter. That reaction is exothermic. They are heated to about 450 degrees Celsius. And remember the catalyst which is used is called ion catalyst. So once the, catalyst, the, the reaction takes place, it's an exothermic reaction. Then stage four, it is where now we are able to produce our ammonia. You can be able to see that our ammonia has been produced. Then the last stage is what you call the recycling. That means the unreacted hydrogen and nitrogen, they are taken back to the catalytic chamber so that more um, ammonia can be able to be produced. So now in that reaction which you have talked about, how do we increase the yield? The yield in chemistry means, or in industrial reactions, it means the amount of ammonia which is going to be produced expressed as a percentage. So when you talk about yield, we are talking about how much ammonia is going to be produced. So the yield 